worried. We were worried. We were worried about vaginas. Woo! We were worried what we think about vaginas, and even more worried that we don't think about vaginas. We were worried about our own vaginas. They needed a context of other vaginas, a community, a culture of vaginas. There's so much darkness and secrecy surrounding them, like the Bermuda Triangle. Ugh, nobody ever reports back from there. In the first place, it's not even easy to find your vagina. Some women go weeks, months, sometimes years, without even looking at it. A high-powered businesswoman was interviewed, and she said she didn't have the time for that. She was busy. Looking at your vagina, she said, is a full day's work. You've got to get down on your back in front of a mirror that's standing on its own, full length, preferred. You've got to get in the perfect position with the perfect lighting that's somehow shadowed by the angle that you're in. You get all twisted up. You're arching your head up, killing your back. You're exhausted by that. She said she didn't have the time for that. She was busy. So there were vagina interviews, which became the vagina monologues. And over 200 women were interviewed. It's a lot of vaginas. Older women, younger women, married women, lesbians, single women, college professors, students, corporate professionals, sex workers, actors. Asian American women, African American women, Hispanic women, Native American women, Jewish women. Okay. Whew. At first, they were a little shy. They were a little reluctant to talk about their vaginas. But once you got them going, you just couldn't stop them. They are really excited to talk about their vaginas. Mainly because no one's ever asked them before. Let's just start with the word vagina. It sounds like an infection at best. Maybe a medical instrument. Hurry, nurse, could you bring me the vagina? <laughs> vagina, vagina. Never sounds like a word you want to say. It's a totally ridiculous, completely unsexy word. If you use it during sex, trying to be politically correct, darling, would you stroke my vagina? Oh, you kill the act right there. We were worried about vaginas, what we call them and what we don't call them. In Great Neck, they call it a pussy cat. A woman there told us her mom used to say, don't wear panties under your pajamas, dear. You need to air out your pussy cat. In Westchester, they called it a pookie. In New Jersey, a twat. So, so there's a powder box, a poochie, a poopy, a pee pee, a poonanny, a pal, a peach, a pooter. A toady, dee dee, dignity. Monkey box. A coochie snorcher, a cooter, a love. Gladys Siegelman, Justin Beaver. <laughs> VA, wee wee, horse spot, nappy dugout. A mongo, a mookie, a pajama, a fanny boo, a marshmallow. A ghoulie, a possible, tamale, totita. Connie. A Mimi in Miami. A split knish in Philadelphia. <laughs> a bearded clam in Bellingham. A box in Bozeman. And a schmendi in the Bronx. We, we were, were worried, worried about, about vaginas. vaginas. Hello, everyone. Hello. Oh, that's much better. Well, some of the monologues are based on one woman's story. Some of the monologues are based on several women's stories surrounding the same theme. And a few times, a good idea became an outrageous one. This monologue is based on one woman's story, but the subject came up in every interview and was often fraught. The subject being, Hair. You cannot love a vagina unless you love hair. Many people do not love hair. My first and only husband hated hair. He said it was cluttered and dirty. 
He made me shave my vagina. It felt puffy and exposed and like a little girl. This excited him. When he made love to me, my vagina felt the way a beard must feel. It felt good to rub it and painful, like scratching a mosquito bite. It felt like it was on fire. There were screaming red bumps. I refused to shave it again. And then, my husband had an affair. When we went to marital therapy, he said he screwed around because I wouldn't please him sexually. I wouldn't shave my vagina. The therapist had a German accent and gasped, oh, between sentences, oh, to show her empathy. She asked me why I didn't want to please my husband. I told her I thought it was weird. I felt little when my hair was gone down there, and I couldn't help talking in a baby voice, and the skin got irritated, and even calamine lotion wouldn't help it. She said that marriage was a compromise. I asked her if shaving my vagina would stop him from screwing around. I asked her if she had had many cases like this before. She said that questions diluted the process. I needed to jump in. She was sure it was a good beginning. This time, when we got home, he got to shave my vagina. He clipped it a few times, and there was a little blood in the bathtub. He didn't even notice because he was so happy shaving me. And then later, when my husband was pressing against me, I could feel his spiky sharpness sticking into me, my naked, puffy vagina. There was no protection. There was no fluff. I realized then that hair is there for a reason. It's the leaf around the flower. It's the lawn around the house. You have to love hair in order to love the vagina. You can't just pick the parts you want. And besides, my husband, he never stops screwing around. the following questions. If your vagina got dressed, what would it wear? Glasses, a beret, a leather jacket, silk stockings, make a pink boa, mm, male tuxedo, jeans, something form-fitting, emeralds, an evening gown, sequins, Armani, only, a tutu, sleeve, Machine washable, costume <laughs> eye mask, purple velvet pajamas, angora, a red bow, ermine and pearl, a leopard hat, mm. silk kimono, sweatpants, a tattoo, an electrical shock device to keep unwanted strangers away, <laughs> high heels, lace, <laughs> and combat boots, mm. purple feathers, twigs, Seashell, <coughs> cotton, a pinafore, a bikini, a slicker. If your vagina could talk, what would it say? Two words. Slow down. <laughs> Is that you? Feed me. I want. Yum, yum. Oh, yeah. Start again. <laughs> no, over. Over there? <laughs> Lick me. Mm -mm. Stay home. Ooh, great choice. <laughs> Think again. More, please. <laughs> Embrace me. Let's play. Don't stop. More, more. Remember me? <laughs> Come inside. Not yet. <laughs> Whoa, mama. Yes, yes. Rock me. Enter at your own risk. Walk. <laughs> oh, God! Thank God! Mm -mm. I'm over here. 
A group of women between the ages of 65 and 75 was interviewed. These interviews were the most poignant, possibly because many of these women had never had a vagina interview before. One woman, who was 72, had never even seen her vagina. She washed herself in the shower and bath, but never with conscious intention. She had never had an orgasm. At 72, she went into therapy as we do in New York. And with the help of her therapist, she went home one afternoon, took a bath, lit some candles, played some music, and she got down with herself. She said it took her over an hour because she was arthritic. But, but when she finally found her clitoris, she said, she cried, this monologue is for her. since 1953. No, it had nothing to do with Eisenhower. <laughs> no, no, it's a cellar down there. It's very damp, clammy. You don't want to go down there, trust me. You'd get sick, suffocating, very nauseating. The smell of the clamminess and the mildew and everything, whew, smells unbearable gets in your clothes. No, there was no accident down there. It didn't blow up or catch on fire or anything. It wasn't that dramatic. I mean, well, never mind. No, never mind. I can't talk to you about this. What's a smart girl like you going around talking to old ladies about their down theirs for? <laughs> we didn't do this kind of thing when I was a girl. What? Jesus, okay. There was this boy, Andy Leftcloth. He was cute. Well, I thought so. And tall, like me. And I really liked him. He asked me out for a date in his car. I can't tell you this. I can't do this. Talk about down there. It's just there, like the cellar. There's rumbles down there sometimes. You can hear the pipes, and things get caught down there, like little animals. And sometimes it gets wet, and people have to come and plug up the leaks. Otherwise, the door stays closed. You forget about it. I mean, it's part of the house, but you don't see it or think about it. It has to be there, though, because every house needs a cellar. Otherwise, the bedroom would be in the basement. Oh, Andy, Andy left cough, right. Andy was very good looking. He was a catch. That's what we called it in my day. We were in his car, a new white Chevy Bel Air. I remember thinking that my legs were too long for the seat. I have long legs. They were smushed up against the dashboard. I was looking down at my big kneecaps when he kissed me in this surprisingly take me by control like they do in the movies kind of way. And I got excited, so excited. And, well, 
There was a flood down there. I couldn't control it. It was like this force of passion, this river of life just flooded out of me, right through my panties and right onto the seat of his new white Chevy Bel Air. <laughs> it wasn't pee, and it was smelly. Well, frankly, I didn't smell anything at all. But he said, Andy said, that it smelled like sour milk and it was staining his car seat. He called me a stinky, weird girl. I wanted to explain that his kiss had caught me off guard, that I wasn't normally like this. I tried to wipe up the flood with my dress. It was a new yellow primrose dress, and it looked so ugly with the flood all over it. He drove me home without saying another word. And when I got out and closed the car door behind me, I closed the whole store, locked it, never opened for business again. I dated some after that, but I was too afraid of flooding. I never even got close again. I used to have dreams, crazy dreams. Oh, they're dopey. Why? Burt Reynolds. I don't know why. He never did much for me in real life, but in my dreams it was always Bert and I, Bert and I, Bert and I. It was always the same general dream. We'd be out, Bert and I. It was the kind of restaurant like you see in Atlantic City with the huge chandeliers and stuff and thousands of waiters with the vests. He'd hand me an orchid corsage, I'd pin it on my blazer. We'd laugh. We were always laughing, Bert and I. Laughing, laughing. We'd eat shrimp cocktail. Huge shrimp. Fabulous shrimp. We were very happy together. Then he'd pull me to him right in the middle of the restaurant. And just as he was about to kiss me, the whole restaurant would start to shake. Pigeons would fly out from under the table. I don't know what those pigeons were doing there. And the flood would come straight from down there. It would pour out of me. It would pour and pour. There were fish in it and little boats. And the whole restaurant would fill up with my flood. Bert would be standing into it, in it, up to his waist looking horribly disappointed that I'd done it again. <laughs> Horrified as his friends, Dean Martin and the like, swam by in their evening gowns and tuxedos. I don't have those dreams anymore. Not since they took away just about everything connected with down there. Moved out the uterus, the pipes, the whole works. The doctor thought he was being funny. He said, if you don't use it, you lose it. But really, I found out it was cancer. Everything around it had to go. Who needs it anyway? Highly overrated. I've done other things. I love the dog shows. I sell antiques. What would it wear? What kind of a question is that? <laughs> what would it wear? It would wear a big sign that said, closed due to flooding. <laughs> what would it say? I told you, it's not like that. It's not like a person who talks. It stopped being something that talked a long time ago. It's a place a place you don't go. It's closed up under the house. It's down there. You happy? You got it out of me. You got me to talk. You got an old lady to talk about her down there. You feel better? Well, actually, I've never told anyone about this before, and I feel a little better.
My vagina's a shell, a round pink tender shell, opening and closing, closing and opening. My vagina's a flower, an eccentric tulip, the center acute and deep, the scent delicate, the petals gentle but sturdy. I did not always know this. I learned this in the vagina workshop. I learned this from the woman who runs the vagina workshop, a woman who believes in vaginas, who really sees vaginas, who helps other women see their own vaginas by seeing other women's vaginas. In the first session, the woman who runs the vagina workshop asks us to draw a picture of our own unique, beautiful, fabulous vaginas. That's what she called it. She wanted to know what our own unique, beautiful, fabulous vaginas looked like to us. One woman who is pregnant drew a, a big red mouth screaming with coins spilling out. <laughs> Another very skinny woman drew a, a big serving plate with a kind of Devonshire pattern on it. I drew a huge black dot with little squiggly lines around it. The black dot was equal to a black hole in space and the squiggly lines were meant to be people or things or just your basic atoms that got lost there. I always saw my vagina as an anatomical vacuum randomly sucking up particles and objects from the surrounding environment. I did not see my vagina in practical or biological terms. I did not, for example, see it as something attached to me. In the workshop, we were asked to look at our own vaginas with hand mirrors. After careful examination, we were to verbally report to the group what we saw. I must tell you that up until this point, everything I knew about my vagina was based on hearsay or invention. I'd never really seen the thing. It never occurred to me to look at it. My vagina existed for me <coughs> on some abstract plane. It seemed so reductive and awkward looking at me like we were in the workshop with our shiny blue mats in our hand mirrors. It reminded me of what the early astronomers must have felt with their primitive telescopes. It was quite unsettling at first, my vagina. Like the first time you see a fish cut open and discover this other bloody complex world inside, right under the skin. It was so raw, so red, so fresh. And the thing that surprised me most were all the layers. Layers inside, layers opening into more layers. My vagina amazed me. I couldn't speak when it came my turn in the workshop. I was speechless. I had awakened to what the woman who ran the workshop called vaginal wonder. <laughs> I just wanted to lay there on my mat, my legs spread, examining my vagina forever. It was better than the Grand Canyon, ancient and full of grace. It had the innocence and freshness of a proper English garden. It was funny, very funny. It made me laugh. It could hide and seek, open and close. <laughs> and then the moment had arrived that I, the woman who ran the workshop asked how many women in the workshop had had orgasms. Two women tentatively raised their hands. I did not raise my hand. But I had had orgasms. I didn't raise my hand because they were accidental orgasms. They happened to me. They happened in my dreams and I would wake in splendor. They happened a lot in water, mostly in the bath, once in Cape Cod. <laughs> they happened on, on horses, bicycles, sometimes the treadmill at the gym. I did not raise my hand because although I had had orgasms, I did not know how to make it was a mystical, magical thing. I didn't want to interfere. It felt wrong getting involved. Contrived. Manipulative. It felt Hollywood. The surprise would be gone, and the mystery. The problem, of course, was that the surprise had been gone for two years. I hadn't had a magical, accidental orgasm in a long time, and I was frantic. That's why I was in the vagina workshop. <laughs> then, the moment arrived that I both dreaded and longed for. The woman who ran the workshop asked us to take out our hand mirrors again and to see if we could locate our clitoris. We were there, a group of us women on our backs, on our mats, 
searching for our spot, our locus, our reason. And I don't know why, but I started crying. Maybe it was sheer embarrassment. Maybe it was knowing I had to give up the fantasy, the enormous, life-consuming fantasy that someone or something was going to do this for me. The fantasy that someone was coming to lead my life, to choose direction, to give me orgasms. I could feel the panic coming, the simultaneous terror and realization that I had avoided finding my clitoris, had rationalized it as mainstream and consumerist because I was in fact terrified that I did not have a clitoris. <laughs> terrified that I was one of those constitutionally incapables one of those frigid, dead, shut down, dry, apricot tasting, bitter, oh my God. I could feel the panic coming. I lay there on my mat, reaching with my fingers, and all I could think about was the time when I was 10 and I lost my gold ring with the emeralds in the lake. How I kept diving over and over again to the bottom of the lake, running my hands over stones and fish and bottle caps and slimy stuff, but never my ring. The panic I felt, I knew I'd be punished. The woman who ran the workshop saw my insane scrambling, seeing in heavy breathing. She came over. I told her, it's gone, it's gone, I've lost my clitoris, I shouldn't have worn it swimming. <laughs> the woman who ran the workshop laughed. She calmly stroked my forehead. She told me, my clitoris wasn't something I could lose. It was me, she said, the essence of me. It was both the doorbell to my house and the house itself. I didn't have to find it. I had to be it. Be it. Be my clitoris. <laughs> be my clitoris. I lay back and closed my eyes. I put the mirror down. I watched myself floating above myself. I watched as I slowly began to approach myself and re-enter. I felt like, like an astronaut re-entering the surface of the earth. It was very quiet, this re-entry, quiet and gentle. I bounced and landed, landed and bounced. I came into my own blood and muscles and cells and then I slid into my vagina. It was suddenly easy and I fit. I was all warm and pulsing and ready and young and alive. And then, without looking, with my eyes still closed, I put my finger on what had suddenly become me. There was a little quivering at first, which urged me to stay. And then the quivering became a quake, an eruption, layers dividing and subdividing. The quaking broke open onto an, an ancient horizon of light and silence, which, which opened onto a plane of music and color and innocence and longing. I felt connection, calling connection as I lay there, thrashing about on my little blue mat. <laughs> my vagina is a shell, a tulip, and a destiny. I am arriving as I am beginning to leave. My vagina, my vagina, me. This is a vagina happy fact. It is from Woman and Intimate Geography by Natalie Anche. pure in purpose. It's the only organ in the human body that's designed purely for pleasure. The clitoris is simply a bundle of nerves, 8,000 nerve fibers to be precise. That's a higher concentration of nerve fibers that's found anywhere in the male or female body, including the fingertips, lips, 
and tongue. And it is twice, twice, twice the number that's found in the penis. Who needs a handgun when you've got a semi-automatic? This monologue is based on in an interview with a woman who had a good experience with a man. <laughs> this is how I came to love my vagina. It's embarrassing because it's not politically correct. <laughs> I mean, I know. It should have happened in the bathtub with salt from the Dead Sea, Enya playing, me loving my woman's self. I know the story. Vaginas are beautiful. Our self-hatred is only the internalized repression and hatred of the patriarchal culture. It isn't real. Pussies unite. I know all of it. It's like, if we grew up in a culture where we were taught fat thighs were beautiful, we'd all be lying on our backs, pounding down milkshakes and Krispy Kremes, thigh expanding. But we didn't grow up in that culture. I hated my thighs, and I hated my vagina even more. I thought it was incredibly ugly. I was one of those women who looked at it, and from the moment I did, I wished I hadn't. It made me sick. I pitied anyone who had to go down there. In order to survive, I began to pretend there was something else between my legs. I pictured furniture, uh, cozy futons with little cotton comforters, <laughs> little velvet settees, leopard rugs, and pretty things, like silk handkerchiefs, quilted teapot holders, and place settings. I became so accustomed to the idea, I lost all memory of having a vagina. Anytime a man was inside me, I pictured him inside a mink-lined muffler, or a Chinese bowl. <sighs> then I met Bob. Bob was the most ordinary man I had ever met. He was tall, thin, nondescript, and he wore khaki tan clothing. He didn't eat spicy food or listen to Prince. He had no interest in sexy lingerie. In the summer, he spent time in the shade. Bob didn't share his inner feelings. He wasn't mean or he didn't have any issues or problems. He wasn't even an alcoholic. <laughs> he wasn't funny or articulate or mysterious. He wasn't mean or unavailable. He wasn't self-involved or charismatic. Bob didn't like to drive fast. I didn't particularly like Bob. I would have missed him altogether if it wasn't for him handing me the change that I dropped on the deli room floor. But when he handed me my quarters and pennies, his hand brushed mine. And that's when something happened. We fucked. <laughs> <laughs> that's when the miracle occurred. Turns out, Bob loved vaginas. He loved the way they felt, loved the way they tasted, and loved the way they smelled. But most of all, and importantly, he loved to look at them. The first time we had sex, he told me he had to see me. I'm right here. <laughs> no, you. I need to see you. Turn on the light, I said, thinking he was a weirdo and freaking out in the dark. Bob turned on the light. Okay, now I'm ready, ready to see you. I'm, I'm right here. Bob began to entrust me. What are you doing, Bob? I need to see you. 
No need, just do it. I need to see what you look like. But you've seen a red leather couch before. But Bob continued, he wouldn't stop. I wanted to throw up and die. This is awfully intimate, Bob. Can't you just do it? No, it's who you are, he said. I need to see. I held my breath. He looked and looked, and he got breathy, and his face changed, and he wasn't ordinary anymore. He was a hungry beast. <laughs> You're so beautiful, he said. You're elegant and deep and innocent and wild. You saw that there, I said. <laughs> it was like he read my palm. I saw that and more, he said, much, much more. Bob stayed there for almost an hour, looking as if he was observing the moon, <laughs> studying a map, or looking into my eyes. It was my vagina. In the light, I saw him as he looked, and he looked so genuinely excited, so peaceful and euphoric. I began to get wet and turned on. I began to see myself the way he saw me. And I began to feel beautiful and delicious, like a great painting or a waterfall. Bob wasn't afraid. He wasn't grossed out. I began to swell and feel proud of my vagina. And Bob? was lost there, and I was with him, in my vagina, and we were gone. <laughs> not so happy fact found in UNICEF's 2005 report, Female Genital Mutilation and Cutting, a Statistical Exploration. Female genital mutilation has been inflicted on approximately 130 million girls and young women. In the 28 countries where it is practiced, mostly in Africa, about three million young girls a year can expect the knife or a razor or a glass shard to cut their clitoris or remove it altogether. In a man, this would range from amputation of most of the penis to removal of all of the penis. Short-term effects include tetanus, hemorrhages, and cuts in the urethra, bladder, and vaginal walls. Long-term effects include chronic uterine infection, increased agony and danger during childbirth, and early deaths. There has been a horrific regional war raging in the Congo over minerals for the last 14 years. Nearly six million people have died, and hundreds and thousands of women and girls have been raped and sexually tortured. The women of Congo and the Foundation Pansy with V-Day have opened City of Joy, a revolutionary leadership community for survivors of violence in the town of Bukavu in eastern Congo. Despite the unthinkable horrors Congolese women have survived, they are devoted with real power and courage to carving out a new path towards a peaceful and enlightened future. And they are still dancing. This monologue is for them. It is gone. It is hard to describe what is there. It is not an organ, exactly. Something the doctor made. Something he put there when I was asleep. You would not recognize it, no. It is not a vagina. It is an outcome. It is the mad look in their eyes. It is the way they took turns and never saw me. It is the tearing and thrusting. It is my daughter and my husband being forced to watch. 
Tis what they stole from our minds. Tis their foul smell down there. The hot plastic, the burning, the burning. There are many of us, thousands, mutilated, cast out. But in the forest, we found each other. At first, we could not not speak, but the logs would not let us sleep, and the swamp bush willow kept us green, and the wind and the mad rains washed our grief. We are gathering now. We are preparing. You will be surprised what lives here now underneath our brightly colored panniers between our legs. Don't be fooled. Our vaginas know how to prepare. Our vaginas know how to dance. Our vaginas know strategies. Our vaginas have nothing to lose. We are coming soon. is all about.
My vagina doesn't need to be cleaned up. It smells good already. <laughs> don't try to decorate. And don't believe him when he tells you, it uh, smells like rose petals. When it's supposed to smell like pussy. <laughs> That's what they're doing, trying to clean it up, make it smell like bathroom spray or a garden. All those douche sprays, floral, berry, rain. I don't want my pussy smelling like rain. <laughs> All cleaned up like washing a fish after you've cooked it. <clears throat> I want to taste the fish. That's why I ordered it. <laughs> Then, there are those exams. Ugh. Who thought them up? There has got to be a better way to do those exams. Why the scary paper dress that scratches your tits and crunches when you lie down so you feel like a wad of paper someone threw away? <laughs> Why the rubber gloves? Why the flashlight all up there like Nancy Drew working against gravity? <laughs> Why the Nazi steel syrups? The mean cold duck lips they shove up inside you. What's that? My vagina's angry about those visits. Mm -hmm. It gets defensive weeks in advance. <laughs> it won't go out of the house. And then, oh, you get there. Don't you hate that? Scoot down. <laughs> Vagina. Why? So you can shove those mean cold duck lips inside it? I don't think so. Why can't they find some nice, delicious purple velvet and wrap it around me? Lay me down on some feathery cotton spread, put on some friendly pink or blue gloves, and rest my feet in some fur-covered stirrups. Mm. Oh yeah, and med students, warm up the duck lips. Work with my vagina. <laughs> but no, more tortures. Dry water fucking cotton, cold duck lips, and thong underwear. This shit's the worst. Thong underwear? <laughs> Moves around all the time, gets stuck in the back of your crusty butt. Mm -hmm. Vagina's supposed to be loose and wide, not held together. That's why girdles are so bad. We need to move and spread and talk and talk. Vaginas need comfort. Make something like that. Something to give them pleasure. No, of course they wouldn't do that. Hate to see a woman having pleasure. <laughs> Particularly sexual pleasure. I mean, make a nice pair of soft cotton underwear with a French tickler built in. <laughs> Women would be coming all day long. <laughs> Coming in the supermarket? Sale on squash aisle three. Oh, sale! <laughs> Coming on the subway? 168th Street. Oh, love the express! talk. It would talk about itself, like me. <laughs> it would do, it would talk about other vaginas. It would do vagina impressions. 
it would wear Harry Winston diamonds. No clothing, just there, all draped in diamonds. My vagina helped release a giant baby. It thought it would be doing more of that. It's not. Now, it wants to travel. It doesn't want a lot of company. It wants to read and know things and get out more. It wants sex. <laughs> it loves sex. It wants to go deeper. It's hungry for depth. It wants kindness. It wants change. It wants silence and freedom and gentle kisses and warm liquids and deep touch. It wants chocolate. <laughs> it wants to scream. It wants to stop being angry. It wants to come. It wants to want. It wants. My vagina? My vagina. Well? It wants, it wants everything. everything. people not understanding that rape is not a joke. I am over people telling me that I am not funny, that women aren't funny. But most of the women I know, and I know a lot of women, are really fucking funny. <laughs> like Sally. We just don't think uninvited penises up our anus or our vagina are a laughing riot. I am over. Hundreds and thousands of women in Congo still waiting for the rapes to end and the rapists to be held accountable. I am over the thousands of women in Bosnia, Burma, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Haiti, Libya, Sudan, you name a place, still waiting for justice. I am over starving Somalian women being raped at the Dadaab refugee camp in Kenya and I am over women being raped at Occupy Wall Street and having to be quiet about it because they're protecting a movement that's fighting against the rape and pillage of the economy and the earth, as if the rape of their bodies was something different. I am over violence against women not being a number one international priority when one in three women will be raped or beaten in their lifetime. The destruction and muting and undermining of women is the destruction of life itself. No women. No future. Duh. Yeah. I am I'm over. The passivity of good men. Where, Where the, the hell, hell are you? you? You live with us. Make love with us. Father us. Befriend us. Brother us. Get nurtured and mothered and eternally supported by us. So why aren't you standing with us? Why aren't you driven to the point of madness and action by the rape and humiliation of us? and depressed from rape, and enraged by rape. I'm over being polite about rape. It's been too long now. We have been too understanding. There are approximately one billion women on the planet who have been violated. One billion women.
Bosnian women refugees were interviewed during the war in Yugoslavia in refugee camps and centers. centers. 20 to 70,000 women were raped in the middle of Europe as a systematic tactic of war. It was shocking to see how little people did to stop it. But then again, in the United States, each year, about 200,000 women are raped, which is another kind of war. This monologue is one woman's story. We do it tonight for this woman, an extraordinary woman of Bosnia and Kosovo. My vagina was green. Water soft, pink field, cow mooing, sun resting, sweet boyfriend touching lightly with soft teeth of blonde straw. There is something between my legs. I do not know what it is. I do not know where it is. I do not touch. Not now. Not anymore. Not since. My vagina was chatty and can't wait. So much, so much saying, can't quit trying, and, and can't quit saying, oh yes. Oh yes. Not since I dreamed there was dead animals sewn in down there with thick black fishing line and the dead animal smell cannot be removed. And its throat is slit. And it bleeds through all my summer dresses. My vagina singing all girl songs, all goat bell ringing songs, all, all wild autumn field songs. Vagina songs, vagina home songs. Not since the soldiers put a long, thick rifle inside me. So cold, the steel rod canceling my heart. Don't know whether they're gonna fire it or shove it through my spinning brain. There were six of them, monstrous doctors with black masks, shoving bottles up me too. There were sticks end of a broom. My vagina, swimming river water, clean spilling water, over sun-baked stone, over stone clit, clit stone, over and over. Not since I heard the skin tear and made lemon screeching sounds. Not since a piece of my vagina came off in my hand. Now, one side of the lip is completely gone. My vagina, a live wet water village. My vagina, my hometown. Not since they took turns inside me for seven days, smelling like feces and smoked meat. They left their dirty sperm inside me. I became a river of poison and pus. And all the crops died up and the fish. My vagina, a live, wet water village. They invaded it. They butchered it. They burnt it. I don't touch now. I don't visit. I live someplace else now. I, I do, do not, not know, know where, where that, that is. is. As part of Eve's work to include the voices of all women who face violence, she interviewed a diverse group of trans women in preparation for this piece.
This piece was performed for the first time by an all transgender cast in LA in 2004. At five years old, I was putting my baby sister's diapers on. I saw her vagina. I wanted one. I wanted one. I thought it would grow. I thought I would open. I ached to belong. I ached to smell like my mother. Her sweet aroma lived in my hair, on my hands, in my skin. I ached to be pretty, pretty. I wondered why I wasn't wearing my bathing suit top at the beach. Why I wasn't dressed like all the other girls. I ached to belong. I ached to be completed, to twirl the baton. They assigned me a sex the day I was born. It's as random as being adopted or being assigned a hotel room on the 30th floor. It has nothing to do with who you are or your fear of heights. But in spite of the apparatus, I was forced to carry around. I always knew I was a girl. They beat me for it. They beat me for crying. They pummeled me for wanting. To touch. To pet. To hug. To help. To hold their hands. For trying to fly in church like Sister Betrell. For doing cartwheels. Crocheting socks. Carrying purses to kindergarten. They kicked the shit out of me every day on my way to school. In the park, they smashed my magic marker painted nails. They punched my lipstick mouth. They beat, beat the girl out, out of my boy. boy. Or they tried. So I went underground. I stopped playing the flute. Be a man. Stand up for yourself. Go punch him back. I grew a full beard. It was good I was big. I joined the Marines. Suck it up and drive on. I became duller, jaded, sometimes cruel. Butch it. Butch it. Butch, Butch it, it up. up. Always clenched, inaccurate, incomplete. I ran away from home. From school. From boot camp. Ran to Miami. Greenwich Village. Aleutian Island. New Orleans. I found gay people. <laughs> Wilderness <laughs> lesbians. Got my first hormone shot. Got permission to be myself. To transition. To travel. To immigrate. 350 hours of hot needles. I would count the male particles as they died. 16 man hairs gone. The feminine is in your face. I lift my eyebrows more. I'm curious. I ask questions. And my voice? Practice, practice. It's all about resonance. Sing song, sing song. Men are monotone and flat. Southern accents are really excellent. Jewish accents really help. Shalom, my friends. <laughs> and my vagina is so much friendlier now. It brings me joy. I cherish it. The orgasms come in waves. Before, they were jerky. I'm your girl next door. My lieutenant colonel father ended up paying for mine. My vagina. My mother was afraid of what people would think of her, that she made this happen. Until one day when we went to church and all the people there said, you have a beautiful daughter. I got to be soft. I'm allowed to listen. I'm allowed to touch. I'm able to, to receive. To be in the present tense. People are so much friendlier to me now. I can wake up in the morning, put my hair in a ponytail. A wrong was righted. I'm right with God. It's like when you're trying to sleep, and there's a loud car alarm. When I got my vagina, it was as if someone finally turned it off. I live now in the female zone. 
But you know how people feel about immigrants. They don't like it when you come from someplace else. They don't like it when you mix. They killed my boyfriend. They beat him insanely as he slept with a baseball bat. They beat this girl out of his head. They didn't want him dating a foreigner, even though she was pretty and she listened and was kind. They didn't want him falling in love with ambiguity. They were scared he'd get lost. They were that terrified. They were that terrified of love. homeless woman over the course of 13 years, only one woman was not sexually abused as a little girl or raped as a young woman. For many of these women, home is a very scary place, a place they have fled. The shelters are ironically the first place many of them ever find safety, protection, and comfort. This is a woman's story as she told it. What isn't in the story is that this woman met another woman in a shelter, and they fell in love. And through their love, they both got out of the shelter system. Memory, December 1965, five years old. My mama tells me, in a scary, loud, life-threatening voice to stop scratching my coochie snotcher. Well, I become terrified that I've scratched it off down there. I do not touch myself again, even in the bath. I'm scared of water getting in and filling me up so I explode. I'll put band-aids over my coochie to cover the hole. But they fall off in the water. I sleep with three pair of happy heart pattern cotton underpants underneath my snap up pajamas. I still want to touch myself sometimes, but I don't. Memory, seven years old. Edgar Montaigne, who is 10, 
he gets angry with me. And he punches me with all of his might between my legs. It feels as if he has broken my entire self. I limp home. I can't pee. My mama says, what's wrong with your coochie snorcher? And I say, mama, Edgar punched it. And she starts yelling at me, saying, don't ever let nobody ever touch you down there ever again. And I say, but mama, he didn't touch it. He punched it. Memory, nine <laughs> years old. I'm playing on the bed, and I'm bouncing and falling. And I impale my coochie snorcher on the bedpost. I make this high-pitched screech noise. It comes straight from my coochie snorcher's mouth. <laughs> I get taken to the hospital, and they sew it up down there where it's been torn apart. <clears throat> Memory, 10 years old. I'm at my father's house. There's a party going on upstairs. Everyone is drinking. I'm playing alone in the basement, and I'm trying on my new white cotton bra and underpants that my father's girlfriend got me. Suddenly, my father's best friend, this big man Alfred, comes up behind me and pulls down my new white underpants and sticks his big hard penis inside my coochie snorcher. I scream! I kick! I try to fight him off! But he still gets it inside. My father is there, then. And he has a gun. There's this terrible, loud noise. And then there's blood all over Alfred and me. Lots of blood. I am sure that my coochie snorcher has finally fallen out. Alfred is paralyzed for life. And my mama, she doesn't let me see my father again for seven years. Memory, 13 years old. My coochie snorcher is a very bad place. A place of nastiness, punching, invasion, and blood. It's a bad luck zone, a site for mishaps. Well, I imagine a freeway between my legs, and I'm traveling, going far away from here. Memory, 16 years old. There's this gorgeous 24-year-old woman in our neighborhood, and I stare at her all the time. One day, she invites me into her car, and she asks me if I like to kiss boys. And I say, no, no, I don't like that. Well, then she tells me that she wants to show me something. And she leans over, and she kisses me softly on the lips. Her lips touching my lips, her tongue touching my tongue. And I was like, wow. And then she asked me if I want to go to her house. And then she leans over and she kisses me again. She tells me to relax, to feel it, to let our tongues feel it. Then she asked my mama if I can spend the night. And my mama is so delighted that such a beautiful and successful woman has taken an interest in me. Well, I'm scared. And I'm so excited. Her apartment is fantastic. She's got it all hooked up. It's the 70s. The beads, the fluffy pillows, mood lights. Well, I decide right then and there that I'm going to be a secretary just like her when I grow up. 
Well, then the pretty lady makes herself a drink with vodka, and she asks me what I'd like to drink, and I say same as her. And she says she doesn't think that my mama would like me drinking vodka. And I say, my mama probably wouldn't like me kissing girls either. <laughs> well, then the pretty lady, she makes me a drink too. And then she changes into this beautiful chocolate satin teddy. And she is just so gorgeous. I always thought that bull daggers were ugly. I tell her, you look great. And she says, so do you. And I say, but all that I'm wearing is this white cotton bra and underpants. Well then, she changes me into another satin teddy. It's lavender, like the first soft days of spring. The alcohol has gone to my head, and I'm loose and ready. There's a picture of a naked woman above her bed. And she gently and slowly lays me down on the bed. And just our bodies rubbing makes me come. Well, then she does everything to me and my coochie snorcher that I always thought was nasty before. And I'm like, wow, I'm so hot and wild. And she says, your vagina untouched by man smells so nice, so fresh. I wish I could keep it that way forever. Well, I get wild then and crazy. And then the phone rings. And of course, it is my mama. I am sure she knows. She always finds out about everything I do. I'm sort of out of breath, and I'm trying to act normal when I get on the phone. And she goes, what, have you been running? And I say, well, no, mama. Um, exercising, yeah. Well, then she tells the beautiful woman to make sure that I'm not around any boys. And the pretty lady tells her, well, trust me, there are no boys around here. <laughs> well, then the pretty lady teaches me everything about my coochie snorcher. And she teaches me all the different ways to please myself. She tells me that I should always know how to please myself. She is very, very thorough. And she says to make sure that I never need to rely on a man. And this beautiful woman, she teaches me. And she takes my coochie snorcher and she teaches me all these different things. She makes me play with myself in front of her. And she teaches me how to be thorough at it and to please myself. And then, in the morning, I'm worried that I've become butch. Because I'm so in love with her. She just laughs. But I never see her again. I realized later that she was my surprising, unexpected, and politically incorrect salvation. She took my sorry ass coochie snorcher and she raised it into a kind of heaven. is based on interviews by Eve Ensler with the women from the Oglala Lakota Nation on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. Their stories reflect the challenges Native women face every day, living in isolation and without resources. According to the Amnesty International report, Maze of Injustice, the average annual rape, rate of rape and sexual assault of American Indian women is 2.5 times higher than all other races. He wanted to go out. He said to me, you stay home. I said, I wanted to go out. He said, you have a baby. I said, it's our baby. 
I laid the baby down. He probably felt my tension because he was whimpering, the baby. I looked up and he slapped me, my husband. Not a blast that knocks your eyes blue. That came later. It was a smack, a hard domestic smack. He looked at me. He was smiling. I couldn't believe it. He was smiling. He slapped me again. His dad was vicious to his mother. I saw him smile. What was that? He was the nicest person. He had long black hair, combing his long hair when we made love. It got loose before. He took me to the dinner, made me go out with his boss. I didn't want to go. He kicked me under the table, told me to look happy told me to smile. I smiled. He kicked me again. Asked me who I was trying to fuck. Asked me to stop coming on to everyone. I stopped smiling. He kicked me again. This went on and on. Outside the restaurant, he grabbed my hair and pulled me down to the curb. It had been snowing. He buried me in the snow. He pounded me in the gutter. The snow was melting. It was sloppy and mud. My hair felt like it was bleeding. I ran to- He was drinking. I was too. I must have blacked out. I woke up in the hospital after five brain surgeries. My hair was gone. They shaved it off. I had to relearn to talk and move my arms. It took me four months to remember how to cook breakfast. I remember putting the egg in the frying pan with the bacon. I knew the egg felt right. I just didn't remember to crack it open. Just the egg in the frying pan in its shell. My head was bald. After 18 years, he beat me. In the morning, when he was so nice again, I would braid his long hair. I would take my time, like I cared so much, and I would do it perfectly, crooked. I would make the hair so they would stand up all crazy-like. Then he'd go forget it that the bruises on my face were his handprints. He'd walk all cocky in the street, all macho in the road, but his braid would be so crooked and look so stupid and wrong. This shouldn't have made me that happy. It really just shouldn't have made me that happy. Heard he was out with a woman making love and she was fluffing his hair while he was wild on top of her. He came home much later and his hair was braided up all right and tight. He passed out from drinking. Then I got up with scissors as he snored and slowly walked to him and just cut the braid off, completely off, and put it in his hand so that when he woke up, he screamed. What the fuck? I'm going to kill you. And he jumped up. But I had tied his shoes together so he couldn't run. <laughs> I didn't go back to him for three years until I knew his hair had grown out again. I 
didn't want to have sex with him. He was drunk. I was just a piece of meat to him, a big hole. I tried to pretend I was asleep. He elbowed me, jerked me, pulled me up. I remember thinking, just get it over with. He got soft and kept pumping and pumping until I got sore. I said it didn't feel good. He said, who were you with? Was he bigger than me? Did you like it? You're like a mouse with a lion. You have to move fast to the door. He picked me up like I was a rag. His eyes were numb. I could hear my son screaming. His mouth was open and his tonsils. I could see his tonsils. My husband beat the shit out of me. He wrapped my long black hair on his hand and jerked my head. I tried to get my son. That's not your son. He said, holding my hair in his hand. That's not your son anymore. Now, he calls me in the middle of night weeping. He didn't mean to beat his wife. He didn't mean to batter her. He was suicidal. He knows what his mother went through. But he can't stop, my son. They took our land. They took our ways. They took our men. We, we want, want them, them back. back. a map of vagina-friendly cities. Welcome, New York City. They are wild for vaginas in Pittsburgh. This one woman in particular was obsessed about a particular kind of word, a pejorative kind of word used to describe the vagina. Her mission was to reconceive. Cunt. I reclaimed it. <laughs> Cunt. Oh, I really like it. <laughs> Cunt. Mm. Listen to it. <laughs> Under, up, urge, uh, uh, you. <laughs> then N, then con. <coughs> Snug rudders fitting perfectly together. N, nexus, now, nest, nice, nice, always.
like that? You guys like that? That was good, right? She was good. She definitely reconceived the word, right? Okay, so it is time for another happy fact. Are you ready? Are you ready? Ready? Yeah. Come on, girl. Your old girl was asked, if your vagina got dressed, what would it wear? Red high tops or a Mets cap worn backwards. If your vagina could speak, what would it say? you of? Oh, is that for me? <laughs> what does your vagina remind you of? <laughs> a pretty dark peach. Or a diamond I found in a treasure and it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> What's special about your vagina. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Somewhere deep inside, it has a really, really smart brain. <laughs> Do you want a sticker? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, and finally, what does your vagina smell like?
time without any mention of birth. This was a bizarre omission. But then again, a male journalist recently asked, what's the connection? Our author, Eve Einzner, was present for the birth of her granddaughter. She was in awe of vaginas before that moment. She is in deep worship now. I was there when her vagina opened. We were all there, her mother, her husband, and I, and the nurse from the Ukraine with her whole hand up there in her vagina, feeling and turning with her rubber glove as she talked casually to us like she was turning on a loaded faucet. I was there in the room when the contractions made her crawl on all fours, made unfamiliar moans leak from her pores, and still there after hours when she just screamed suddenly wild, her arms striking at the electric air. I was there when her vagina changed from a shy sexual hole into an archaeological tunnel, a sacred vessel, a Venetian canal, a deep, deep well with a tiny stuffed child inside waiting to be rescued. I saw the colors of her vagina. They changed. I saw the bruised, broken blue, the blistering tomato red, the gray pink, the dark. I saw the blood like perspiration along the edges, the yellow-white liquid, the shit, the clots, pushing out all the holes, pushing harder, saw through the hole, the baby's head, scratches of black hair, saw it just there, behind the bone, a hard, round memory, as the nurse from the Ukraine kept turning and turning her slippery hand. I was there when each of us, her mother and I, held a leg and spread her wide, pushing with all our strength against her pushing, and her husband sternly counting, one, two, three, telling her to focus harder. <laughs> we looked into her then. We couldn't keep our eyes out of that place. We forget the vagina, all of us. What else could explain our lack of awe, our lack of reverence? I was there when the doctor reached in with Alice in Wonderland spoons, and there as her vagina became a wide operatic mouth, singing with all its strength. First, the little head, and then a gray flopping arm, and then the fast swimming body swimming quickly into our weeping arms. I was there later when I turned and faced her vagina. I stood and let myself see her all spread, completely exposed, mutilated, swollen and torn, bleeding all over the doctor's hands who was calmly sewing her there. I stood and her vagina suddenly became a wide, red, pulsing heart. The heart is capable of sacrifice. So is the vagina. The heart is able to forgive and to repair, it can change its shape to let us in. It can expand to let us out. So can the vagina. It can ache for us and stretch for us and die for us and bleed and bleed us into this difficult, wondrous world. I was there in the room. I remember.
sex workers have a rich, compelling, complex relationships with their vaginas. This particular woman blows my mind. She was a sex worker, but she only did sex work with women. I love vaginas. I love women. I do not see them as separate things. Women pay me to dominate them, to excite them, to make them come. I did not start out this way. No, to the contrary. I started out as a lawyer. <laughs> But in my late 30s, I became obsessed with making women happy. It began as a mission of sorts. Then I got involved in it. I got rather good at it, kind of brilliant. I started getting paid for it. And it was as if I had found my calling. I wore outrageous outfits when I dominated women, lace and silk and leather. And I used props, whips, handcuffs, rope, dildos. There was nothing like this in tax law. <laughs> there were no props, no excitement, and I hated those blue corporate suits. Although I wear them from time to time now in my new line of work, and they serve quite nicely. There were no props in corporate law. No wetness, no dark, mysterious foreplay, no erect nipples, no delicious mouths, but mainly, there was no moaning. Not the kind I'm talking about anyway. <laughs> this is the key I see now. Moaning is the thing that ultimately seduced me and got me addicted to making women happy. When I was a girl and I would see women in the movies making love, making strange, orgasmic noises, I used to laugh. I got strangely hysterical. I couldn't believe that big, outrageous, ungoverned sounds like that came out of women. I longed to moan. I would practice in front of a mirror on a tape recorder, moaning in various keys and oh, various tones. But always, when I played it back, it sounded fake. It was fake. It wasn't rooted in anything sexual, really, only in my desire to be sexual. But then, when I was 10, I had to pee really badly once on a car trip. It went on for almost an hour, and when I finally got to pee in this dirty little gas station, it was so exciting, I moaned. I moaned as I peed. I couldn't believe it, me moaning in a Texaco station in the middle of Louisiana. <laughs> I realized right then that moans are connected with not getting what you want right away, with putting things off. Moans were best when they came from this hidden, mysterious place inside of you that was speaking its own language. I realized that moans were in fact that language. I became a moaner. It made most men anxious. Frankly, it terrified them. I was loud, and they couldn't concentrate on what they were doing. First, they'd lose focus, and then they'd <coughs> lose everything. <laughs> we couldn't make love in people's homes. The walls were too thin. I got a reputation in my building, and people stared at me with contempt in the elevator. Men thought I was too intense. Some called me insane. I began to feel bad about my moaning. I became quiet and polite. I made noise into a pillow. I learned to choke my moan, to hold it back like a sneeze. I began to get headaches and stress-related disorders. I was becoming hopeless when I discovered women. I discovered that most women loved my moaning. But more importantly, I discovered how deeply excited I got when other women moaned, when I was responsible for other women moaning. I made love to moaners, and I found this place inside them, and they shocked themselves in their moaning. I made love to everyone, and they just found a deeper, more penetrating moan. 
It was a kind of surgery, a kind of delicate science, finding the tempo, the exact location, or the home of the moan. That's what I called it anyway. <laughs> Sometimes I found it over a woman's jeans. Sometimes I snuck up on it, off the record, quietly disarming the surrounding alarms and moving in. Sometimes I used force, but not violent, oppressing force, more like dominating, I'm gonna take you someplace, don't worry, lay back and enjoy the ride kind of force. <laughs> Sometimes it was simply mundane. I found them on before things even started while we were in the kitchen eating chicken or salad, just casual, right there with my fingers. Here it is, like that, real simple, all mixed in with the balsamic vinegar. Sometimes I used props. I loved props. Sometimes I made a woman find her own moan in front of me. I waited, stuck it out until she opened herself. I wasn't fooled by the minor, more obvious moans. No, I pushed her all the way into her power moan. There's the clit moan. Uh, uh, uh. The vaginal moan. Uh, uh, uh. The combo clit vaginal moan. Uh, 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 uh. There's the almost moan. Militant bisexual moan. Diva moan. Oh. 
tortured Zen moan. There's the student moan. would like to thank you all for coming to our show and thank you all for supporting a very important cause. I would like to ask you now to please stand if you know if you or anyone you know has been affected by rape or any other form of violence. Please take a moment to look around. Thank you so much for sharing. Please be seated. Since 1998, V-Day, the global movement that grew out of Evensler's play, The Vagina Monologues, 
has focused its attention on areas of the world where women and girls are the most vulnerable. As Vire approaches its 15th year of activism, we're spotlighting the common histories of racism, poverty, colonialism, slavery, and war that has thrown women into an endless cycle of violence and disempowerment. Vide's work in the war-ravaged Democratic Republic of Congo, post-Katrina New Orleans, and the earthquake-devastated country of Haiti, is to reveal the links between these issues and to support the women on the ground struggling for liberation and a violence-free future. For my sisters in Port-au-Prince, Bukavu, New Orleans. What broken, earthquaked, bombed out, worn down, worn over, leafy flooded? What bright yellow-green speckled mango, sitting dust, light barefooted, pig walking, goat crossing, garbage piled high, cement broken, hot daylight, Hungry, history-shackled, hands missing, rubber cutting, boy running, girl bleeding, displaced evacuee exiled, water coming, earth cracking, houses falling, vaginas splitting. What UN peacekeepers, US guards, guns pointing, what red, yellow, green, X, no body markings, what cold company men, by warm, dead-bodied land out from under. What money promised? Nine billion, 29 billion, many billion, never arriving billion. What ex-presidents, missing presidents, corrupt presidents? What four-year-old, six-year-old, 18-year, raped out in Superdome camp burning village. What outside, well-intended, saving and rendering powerless victims made victims victims. What melting, penetrable tents, skin, soul. What, what world? world? What people having everything keep going while Garbage swallows, boys digging, children sinking, mothers dying, birthing. What's woman carrying charcoal sacks, potato sacks, carrying mini knives? Mace under bright colored panier skirts, carrying babies on breasts, bath, carrying songs, dances, churches, fields, abuse centers carrying possibilities, bellies, beans, words, what woman carrying on, I'll shine in filth, I'll shine in odds. What happens now, New Orleans, Haiti, Congo, women? Now! Or never? Women claiming what they carry, claiming, carrying. Now women colored brightly, carrying everything. 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 Carrying on, I tell you. Carrying on. 